I'm heading out for another one. Uh, this is going to be a little different. I've been to this area before. Uh, Patrog State Forest, the Peg Mill Shelter is where I'm heading to. But the difference is, you can see, uh, it's been raining. It is raining right now. So, I'm going to have a few more challenges than I usually have. I'm actually going out for some backpacking, uh, camping at one of the shelters, but also small game hunting. So I'll show you the rifle I'm about to take with me for, for that, hopefully, um, see if I can get anything. Rabbit, squirrels, grouse, whatever's out there. And uh, if I get something, I'll show you how to prepare it. I actually learned from another YouTube video from someone else on how to prepare up small game, and it was a big help for me. It's really, really simple once you do it for dressing them. But my uh, trying to get a fire going in this, I brought my little uh, my BioLite stove, so we'll see how that goes. I'm probably going to cheat a little bit, and um, if you can if you can see right there, I have a I have a wood bin. I'm going to get some of the smaller pieces of, of pine and stuff, put them in a Ziploc bag, and not enough to cook all my meals, but just enough to get something started. I'll be able to find some dry stuff when I get out there, even though it's been raining afternoon yesterday, all night, um, into the morning today, and it might even be continuing to rain while I'm hiking. But I'll show you a few tricks on how to get some dry wood even when it's been raining for a while. I mentioned it before on one of my videos, I think, one of the, the nighttime campsite videos I have back here, but here we go. This is something else I never mentioned at any of my other backpacking in the Patrug Forest videos, I don't believe. Um, you need to get a permit, the state requires you to get a permit to camp over at one of the shelters. This is what the permit looks like. So. What you have to do is write a letter in to the DEP. You can find the information on uh, on the internet. Go to the state's website, and then, or even just Google uh, Patrug State Forest Backpacking, and it'll come up with a page with the, the different shelters, little maps of the shelters, and it'll tell you uh, who to mail the request for a permit to. Really, really simple. On this, it's actually, the address is right there that's where you would mail it to so it just has to include your name, your address, uh, the number of people going, if there's anyone under 18 and then they uh, they mail you out one of these permits so what I usually do I also have my small game hunting permit for the state I have that in uh, a ziploc bag obviously to keep it dry it comes in its own case but the middle of the case right here is exposed so I mean you can still ruin your your permit that way and they're not very durable I usually take the backpack and permit put it right in the same bag with that and that way if a uh, DEM officer ever comes by and asks for any of your uh, information you have it all right here so uh, you can just hand it over to them it makes life a lot easier but that's one other thing I thought I'd mention before I head out and or even before I show you the, the rifle I'm hunting with. Well, here's the uh, here's the rifle I have. It's uh, this is one of the magazines for it. The thing about Connecticut is it's a an assault weapons ban state, so they have a lot of restrictions on the firearms you can own. One of the differences between Connecticut and all the other states that have assault weapons bans is that there's no magazine capacity limit. You can have as many rounds as you want. This one right here also came with it. This magazine has 10 rounds. This is a Massachusetts compliant um, magazine for, for their assault weapons ban. They can only, when you order or buy these, if, you're, if you live in Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, I think there's another state, um, you can only get, they'll only ship this kind of a magazine to you, to your uh, your house or your FFL. And, um, but like I said, in Connecticut, all the other same restrictions as the other states that I mentioned apply. The only difference is there is no magazine capacity limit. This right here, this is one of my, this is my small game hunting rifle. It's an M&P 1522. Let's see it. right there 
it's sort of an AR clone. Um, it had an open sight that mounted to this rail right here. It had one over here and then the, uh, the rear sight back here. They have the same quick release screws that are on this, the thumb release that you can just unscrew. I take those off so that the, the scope mount, because I for small game hunting it's it's just much easier for me with a with a scope as opposed to the tactical um open sights. And um this is a very, very accurate gun. I've I've had no trouble every time I shoot it a uh, small game I hit it. I, I never have any trouble with it. And one thing I did do to upgrade this besides the scope obviously and the scope mounts was um I replaced the stock and the the pistol grip with Magpul. I don't know if you can see that right there. Magpul grips. The nice thing about them is <clears throat> they're, they're more comfortable on your hand. And right here, uh, there's a there's a release in the bottom that you can you can pop out. Let me show you. Yeah. This butt plate I guess for the bottom of the pistol grip it comes off and there's a, a storage space in there I usually store um, in a lot of my different rifles if there's areas to do it um, any kind of a little survival helper this one I have uh, balls of cotton in and um, I put also neoprene gloves in there so if I'm dressing down small game uh, I can stay cleaner than I would if I didn't have them I might have some in my first aid kit in my backpack anyway, but if I'm not going out backpacking, it's just nice to to have that. And then this just slides in, locks in place, and it's all right there. So it's it's just a, a good thing to have. Another restriction as far as uh, Connecticut goes, for a weapon like this, you cannot have um, more than two of the, the evils, they call it. A pistol grip. It can't have a flash suppressor with a pistol grip. It can't have a retractable stock with a uh, pistol grip. That's all illegal. This is actually, you can see right there, it's actually a pinned stock. So even though this is the type that moves, in because it's pinned, it's it's a fixed stock. It's considered a fixed stock. So this is uh, totally legal in this state because of that. If that pin were not in there and you could slide this back and forth this would not be a Connecticut compliant gun and uh, one of the reasons I got this one um, is I used to have a GSG 5 but that one it's just it's a nightmare to clean you, you have to there's a kit that comes in the stock and because it's, it's a hollowed out solid or um, full stock there's no no gaps in it or anything and um, that one has like a whole screwdriver kit you need to take it apart to clean it and it's like a half hour 40 minutes this one to clean it's got two pins one there one there you can see right here you just pop the pin out the whole action breaks down the bolt slides right out easy easy access for cleaning I mean what was that about seven seconds pop the pin, pull the bolt, and because of that, it also leaves you a nice clear access to the, the breech in here and the barrel for uh, for cleaning out the barrel. So you can just run your uh, cleaner right through it. And then same thing, getting back together. Just put that, lock that down, and it's good to go again. Pins lock back in and everything's all set. The nice thing about this kind of a, a rifle as far as some of these AR clones that, that are out there the M&P has a functioning bolt lock right here when you when you pull the bolt back you can actually push the bottom of that down and it locks the bolt back and you just push the this this button right here if you just push it down it slides forward um, yeah, but that's the rifle I'm using. Those are the, the magazines. And I also, for backpacking and just for general, uh, ease of carrying, they have all different kinds of slings. If you noticed actually on this, I, I have this clip with the, the nylon, um, strap going around it here. 
That's for a single point sling. I have one right here. I think this one's made by Blackhawk. Um, it's actually a really nice one. The, the clip goes on it, and it just sits... You just wear it around your shoulder like that, and then the uh, the rifle hangs off of this down here. It's easier for me for, for backpacking because you have, obviously, the shoulder straps on, and when you have that, you, you can't really, like, throw the rifle over your shoulder and the straps for the backpack over your shoulder. So this kind of tucks underneath the backpack. I put this on first, throw the backpack on, and then you can just take the rifle and clip it onto there, and it just kind of hangs on the front of you. You obviously have to hold it, but you can let it go and it, it'll hang there if you stop for a second. But, yeah, that's a another nice thing to have when you're doing this. So that's that. Hopefully I'll uh, be able to get something, and if I do, I'll uh, I'll show it on the camera and I'll show how to dress it. So, let's get out there. Alright, I, uh, I got geared up. I just got everything packed. Got my pack on again. This pack is actually even heavier than the one I had up Mount Musalaki. I brought my uh, four season tent this time, mainly because my kid was playing in my three season tent and it's still set up over there and it's wet from the rain. So it's a Eureka High Camp tent. You'll see it getting set up when I get to the shelter and um, it's like 9.8 pounds so I got that all the usual stuff from my pack here along with uh, like I said I got my uh, my knife this is the this is the three-point sling I'm not even holding this it's just here so yeah I'll end up holding it while I'm walking but that's what I meant about the one point sorry one point sling it just it just sits there and it keeps everything conveniently out of the way. I had one more afterthought before I uh, started off on this hike. It, it was drizzling again. It had stopped, so I thought maybe I was good. But then I, since I was still close to the house, I um, went back and checked the weather. And it is supposed to rain more today. So I, I waterproofed this thing because this is worth too much to to um actually it's worth about 480 bucks I think I paid for it so comparably it's expensive for a 22 but it's cheap for a sportster rifle considering what you get uh, so only things that matter really that have to be exposed are the, the lenses for the scope and obviously the tip of the barrel this is uh, semi-auto so I left it baggy on one side here so that the cartridge there we go. so that the cartridges can eject into the side of the bag here and uh, the stuff in the back is exposed because it's all polymer I have nothing to worry about with the polymer it's, it, you just dry it off and it's fine and only thing that would mess with this is um, the sun UV rays would, would make this brittle but it's fine it, it's like brand new anyway I got it like a year ago, year and a half ago, I think. But yeah, so I didn't want to take any chances on having the barrel rusted or anything, so I made sure I, I got this pretty waterproofed. Covered the magazine, too. Well, I just linked up with uh, one of the Patchogue State Forest's blue trails. You can see the, uh, see, uh <laughs> right there, the marker on the tree. Those go all the way around. This is not the Patchogue Trail. I think this is the Neolithic Trail, something like that. And it's a, a seldom used trail, but it links up with the Patchogue Trail after you get across a river down the path here. When I get there, I'll show you where it is. A lot of people ride their ATVs up and down here. Hunters come out here all the time. It's a quieter part of the forest, so... There are some pretty well-traveled parts. Mount Misery, where the campground is, and then uh, down at Green Falls, near where the shelter is, there's a lot of foot traffic, too, because there's dirt roads going in. They're kind of rocky and potted and stuff, but people manage. I get my car down there, no problem. So that's where I'm headed. And that's actually a, uh, a really good spot for the small game, too. Once the, uh, the campground closes, it's like the, the animals know that... Uh, 
foods available in that area because people obviously are messy, so they uh, they find scraps to feed on, but they hang around even after the people are gone thinking that more's coming. Here's one of the streams that I had to cross. It's one of the bigger ones. I came from up in there. You can see the pile of rocks here by the water. And then that little area of brush with the space in between. I came from up there. The path had to cross this. People, you can see over here, they drive their ATVs right across it. I'm surprised. They must have snorkels on them or something. I came across right there with that makeshift bridge that someone built. I've checked this stream before for trout and stuff. It never dries up, even in the, the dead of August when it, it's like drought conditions, this still has water. But for some reason, I guess birds never dropped any eggs for anything over here. You can see it's, it's fairly uh, shallow. There are spots. It's deceiving, though. The moss makes it look like it's shallower than it is. But I, I'd say with it not taking the mud into consideration, it's probably only two feet deep maybe in the deepest point over here it usually shallows down to about a foot some parts downstream here um, they get a little bit deeper and sandier they're actually kind of neat and <laughs> I'd like to soak in them in the summertime when I come and do these hikes but uh, it's really tucked out of the way most people in Patchog that do the hiking out here don't see this this is a very obscure trail so uh, yeah soak up the sights Check it out. I see one, I've seen uh, one red-headed woodpecker, a really big one. I mean, like, uh, say from from here to about here. That was probably the height of it. Not counting the tail. Uh, I was surprised it was on the side of the low on the ground, not even up in the trees on the side of the path. And it, I spooked it, and it went flying off to the side. Too fast for me to get on camera or anything, but. It was neat to see. There was a lot of wildlife out here. Uh, up at the beginning, by my house, there was a couple of cardinals, male and female. There was a, an oriole, which I was surprised to see. You usually don't see too many of them around here. This is actually a better view of the, uh, the stream. You can actually see this is one of its wider points, almost like a flood basin. But this is actually the width of it, not the length. It it goes down that way and, and back this way to my right and left. And up that little, there's that brush on the base of that tree at the other end of the water here. Right up there, there's a pile of rocks going up the hill. That's the path that, that leads up towards Route 138. It's not far, maybe like, I mean, if, you, if you're taking your time walking your dog and or whatever, probably about 20 minutes from the road to here. It's worth it though. You usually see a lot of stuff out here. Now like Les Stroud has said before uh, in some of his videos, no matter where you go in the world, you, you, no matter how remote you are, you're gonna find human garbage places. You can see over here someone left a beer can out there. In a survival situation, I guess you can make some use to that, but it kinda sucks to see it out here. Where I'm at, um, is actually what's known as edge habitat. There's two different habitats that meet right here. Up in, in front of me, this way, it's mostly evergreens. And then back in behind me, where I came from over here, you can see it's mostly hardwoods, deciduous trees, uh, which are trees that lose their leaves in the fall time. And this is, uh, with the water supply, this is actually a, a good area if you were out hunting to, to stake out a spot and, and just sit and wait. Since I'm just passing through and small game, like uh, what I'm looking for, ends up uh, being on the move up in the trees most of the time. And as for the rabbits, they're in fields and in the grasslands and stuff. Um, this is not a place I'm going to stop and spend any time, but I just thought I'd show it off. Well, this is, uh, this is another marker point here. This is actually the Patchogue Trail. It's, you can see it's that light blue color. The other 
sign I showed you back there, the other marker on the tree, that one was actually a dark blue. So some people just, oh yeah, blue mark on the tree, that's it. We're on two different trails now. This is actually a, well, I guess you call it a four-way intersection. <laughs> as far as the woods go, there's a trail that goes up here that continues. That's the one I was following. I'm actually going to take a left and go down this way, follow the Patchogue Trail. The Patchogue Trail from this point will take me all the way to the shelter I'm looking for. First it takes you to the Green Falls campground, sort of passes through, and then uh, it continues on to where the Patchogue Trail is. There is a, a side trail that shoots off at Green Falls. Uh, Patchogue goes, the trail goes one way, and you gotta follow a different trail just for a little bit off to the shelter. I actually found some uh, squirrel sign, it could be chipmunk too, right here on this log if you can see. They took this pine cone and chewed it apart. Here's the, here's the stalk. They pull the leaflets off of it like these and then um, eat the seeds from in between them. So one of them just roosted up here, hopped on this dead log and had a little dinner. That's a good thing. I've been looking for nests too. Ugh. Looking for squirrel nests also. So Haven't seen too many over here so that's probably a chipmunk, ground squirrel, something like that. But I'm going to continue to look. Like I said, Green Falls is the better spot for that type of hunting. And there is a big field leading up to there that might have rabbit in it. I love when I'm walking out in the woods and I come across something that just seems like it's out of place or shouldn't be here. This is an old fallen down building. Not very big, maybe about the size of a shed or something. You could tell, I mean, although it is old, it's not extremely old because... Here we go. The nails here... They're actually uh, manufactured nails. They're not like blacksmith nails. The uh, caps for the tar paper on the top over there. You can see they have the metal caps going. A couple over there. I was poking through this last time I came down here and I did find the remnants of a cast iron stove, like a wood stove. Um, I don't see where it is now. It's probably covered back up by a year or two of leaves again. But, yeah, I mean, we're pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. There's not any roads that come near here. The The nearest dirt road is one of the two that goes to the Green Falls, and it's, it's way up ahead where I'm going. So I don't know why someone would have built this little shack out here. And you can see on the other side there some of the sheet metal for something. And I mean, I don't know if it was just a little hunting shed or something, something for the DEP. Who knows, but... It's kind of neat to come across this kind of stuff. Back in here behind me, I just spooked uh, two big deer that were bedded down a little bit back this way in the thick of it. They heard me coming or smelled me, and I, I'm sure they heard me. I was, I, mean, I had the bag crinkling from my rifle and everything else, but they ran off straight ahead and to my right a little bit, off into some deeper woods. But, yeah, this is a good year. I should have mentioned this uh, earlier when I was talking about the areas for hunting, the edge forest and all that. This year is actually um, an even better year for game to be bigger because uh, the oak trees, the, the acorns that they eat, um, they produ oaks produce acorns in two-year cycles. Last year there was almost none on the ground. This year there's a ton of them everywhere. And because of that, the animals are able to fatten up better for the winter. So this is going to be a good year for a lot of hunters. You'll notice, I mean, they're, they're all around me right here. There's a pile of them down there. Last year, I mean, you had to hunt a long way to find one or two. It doesn't mean that there isn't the occasional tree that will produce them once in a while. But you'll see if uh, you're any kind of woodsman where you go out and about like this that every two years one year will have more acorns than the, the year after and vice versa but yeah that was just really neat I spooked some deer they popped the tail up and, and bolted off 
Okay, I made it. Uh, this is the, the shelter right around me here. Hanging all my stuff up. I uh, made my rifle safe. The magazine's up there. It's unloaded. Um, started just hanging my stuff up. There was actually some string right there on the wall, which is great, and two hooks up on the, the rafters here. I just took it, strung it across, and everything I had that I was wearing is soaked. It, I made it here just in time, too, because I don't know if you can see it on the camera, but it's pouring out there. I mean, literally, I, I got in here, I took my wet shoes off, stuck them right there, and it started downpouring. It was raining constantly the whole time, but it was more that light, annoying drizzle rain. Uh, I had, a, obviously, a spare set of clothes. I saved you the, the, that part, the housekeeping and changing. So, there's all my clothes from when I came in. They're all soaked. This is all dry stuff I had in my backpack over here. I had my Gore-Tex coat hanging over the top of the backpack, and uh, that kept it dry and everything else dry. I have a rain cover for it anyway, but it's just easier to carry the coat if I'm not wearing it by draping it over the pack, so I ended up doing that. Okay. This again, my uh, BioLite stove. This is the uh, cooking chamber, the combustion chamber. This is the power head. Um, from being up Mount Musalaki, uh, yeah, if you can see all that on there, I had to burn a lot of evergreen up Mount Musalaki, and obviously evergreen has lots of uh, tar and sap so it fouled up the top of this. This is just a copper uh, probe here that goes into the combustion chamber. What happens is this copper probe converts heat into electricity to power a fan that's in there that circulates the air inside of the combustion chamber here. So it blows it in that little slot where my thumb is right there circulates the air and makes for a cleaner burn. I actually only have a small pile of wood over here by my backpack next to the rifle and everything's soaked. I'll find some dry wood. Uh, I just have to I just have to work at it a little bit. Now one thing with this it's more efficient if you just lightly clean off all that stuff. I don't obviously use the sharp blade side because then you dull the crap out of your knife. But if you use the back side of it, because I didn't bring any uh, any sandpaper or anything, obviously. But I I had so much stuff in my pack, and I thought I had everything. Turns out I forgot one of the kind of really important things. Um, I forgot to bring my pot, my measuring cup. And, uh, yeah, and I'm not sure if I have a fork in there or not. I thought I did, but if I don't, I'll be making one of them out of a mountain laurel, too. And I've done that in one of my other videos. I just, I'll need some kind of eating utensil, and I'm not using my knife to eat with. So what I had to do on the way up, just a little bit ways down the path, I found two aluminum cans. Now, obviously... The combustion chamber is too big, too wide to put the can on. It's just going to fall right in. So I grabbed the second one. Obviously, i got to clean the crap out of these. Down the path down there, uh, sorry, it's over to the side here, there's uh, a little brook, a stream, and that's the water source for this shelter. I'm going to go down there, clean off these two cans inside and out, um, I brought this little camping sponge that I I have 
for cleaning all my pots and pans and stuff. And I'm going to use this smaller can, cut off the top, cut off the bottom. I'll show you that in a little bit in another video clip. Um, slit the side open, flatten it out, and use that as sort of like a base to lay over the top of this so that that can has something to sit on here. So I'll flatten that out, lay it over the top, puncture it a bunch of times to make holes in it so that the, the flames can come through. And I'm going to use this bigger one, which is a, a 16 ounce can. A cup is 8 ounces, so 16, 2 cups. That's just the right size to, if I fill it up to the top for boiling water for my mountain house meals, the mountain house meals need two cups of water, depending on what ones you get. The scrambled egg ones need less. I think it's like a cup and a half, a cup and a third, something like that. Um, but as far as what I have for meals, it's, it's two cups of water boiled up, poured in the, uh, the mix, stirred up. So in order for me to eat, uh, I'm going to have to improvise here. And... <laughs> It's sort of ironic, the, uh, at the, the beginning of the, the trip, I obviously didn't videotape much on the walk because of the rain, I didn't want to get my phone soaked and ruined, but I, I, I pointed out the can on the ground and said, yeah, I mean, you can go anywhere in the world and no matter how remote you are and find garbage, and turns out in this case, finding that garbage is a, a big help for me because... Otherwise, I do have beef jerky and I have dehydrated apples. I, I have a dehydrator at home and a food saver. So I, uh, I dehydrated the apples, then I sealed them up in the food saver bag, and I have that in my pack for just snacks to munch on. But I wouldn't have been able to eat my meals if I didn't have some way to boil water, and these cans are going to get the job done for me. So when I go to cut these up, after they're all cleaned out and everything, I'll show you what I plan on doing to, to get those going. And also, I could uh, scoot over here. I don't even have any socks on right now because they're up there drying on the clothesline. Um, I could have set my tent out there. There's a spot that's nice and clean in the dirt um, or, or clean, free of brush and stuff. But this thing's more than big enough. I'm just going to set my tent up in here. It's a freestanding tent. Again, it's a Eureka High Camp. I'll show you that when I get the bag out and uh, have the stuff laid out. But for now, oh yeah, it's really coming down now. You can probably hear it on there hitting the roof. Um, for now, I'm going to clean away at these cans, get the, the probe on this cleaned up, and then uh, get my eating situation taken care of before I, I go find wood and then set my tent up. So first things first. Well here's a better view of what's around me. There's seating and a uh, fire pit right there. It's obviously soaked. I think they cut those trees that way to make even more seating like the stumps with the backrest something like that. Uh, this is my tent right here. I should only have to use the poles and the actual tent part, which is the furthest from the camera right now. Don't need the stakes because I'm not staking it into here. Um, it comes with those aluminum poles here. And uh, stuff sack. These are my stakes with their stuff sack for that. This right here is the rain fly. Obviously, I have a roof over my head, so I don't need the rain fly. And uh, that's the tent, so I'll set that up in a bit. My stove is all cleaned out. Uh, I'm just going to head down now and take those cans to the, the stream and clean them out even further. I got them cleaned out pretty good, and boiling, heating them over that stove will kill anything that was there anyway. But I just don't like to look at stuff with like bits of leave on them if I'm going to be making water out of it, boiling water out of it, so... Yeah. And then I'll go and try and find some dry wood out there. Alright, uh, mission accomplished. I, I got these cans pretty decent straightened out. 
I hate doing this, but I'm about to use my knife to cut the top off of this. I want to I want to cut it on the inside. Gotta be careful because I don't want to go hunting for another can. Um, there we go. All right. Huh. Let me dump this out. That's the top taken off. I'm going to try and bend in the sharp metal as best I can. So, I mean, I don't plan on sticking my hands in there, but it's just a good safety thing. I have a first aid kit. Like I said, I just don't want to get cut and have to break it open. Um, Good enough. Nice thing is about this though, it's uh, self measuring. It's a 16 ounce can, it's two cups. So all I have to do is get that boiled, fill it up to the top, get it boiled after I rinse it out some more. Now that I get the top off, it'll be much easier to clean out. That's the part I'm worried about is getting the inside of this cleaned out with the sponge without getting cut. Now, with this can right here, I'm going to cut the bottom off it, the top off it, and peel it out. That's half done. Just get the top now. I'll tell you what, I mean, <laughs> in a way, this is. This has come down to a little bit of a sur survival for, for getting food that I have already. I just can't make any use of it. And this is one of those situations where you got to be so careful. I mean, those edges on that can right now, those are like razors. And I don't... Yeah. Last thing I need is to get sliced open. And it's so easy. Alright, so there we go. I've gotten this. I can even feel the sharp edges right there. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I got this. I'm trying to be so careful with my bare hands here because. So now we got this. I gotta measure it up with the stove. I'll take these. These are the scraps. Put them over here. I have Ziploc bags for uh, for garbage. I'll, I'll take that out with me. Ugh.
Okay. All right, there we go. Flattened out. It's not the most stable thing I've ever built, but you make do. Yeah. Another thing I have to do, because this is going to stop most of the heat from getting to the can, I have to get holes in this now, in just the right spots, so that the heat transfers from, from the stove to what I'm trying to cook. Um, What I might do You know what, I'll finish modifying it and then I'll turn the video back on when I'm done I'll show you what I've come up with Okay, I uh, just got done cleaning out the inside of that that Coors can and I wanted to show something else that I just picked up on the way out I'm never uh, at a loss for trying to catch critters while I'm out here to show on video for people to see this is called a wood frog. You can see the back there. It doesn't look anything like a normal frog. And the sides of its belly, if you can tell, probably not on this, but it's got a really light green color to the side of its belly over here. Neat, neat, neat little frog. It's almost like a, an orange color to its back. You might even be able to see the side colors there. Obviously I'm going to let this guy go, but it was just a really cool thing to find out there. They got these stripes going down the, the top of their back. You can see that there. They blend right in with the leaves. They look just like a leaf. I mean, with the, especially in the fall time with the trees changing from you know uh, green to yellow and orange and all that. It's got a little bit of all those colors in it. And a really, really neat little uh, frog here. I'm just going to let it go out the front. You see its snout there. It's got the, the stripes on it. Okay. There it goes. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that still. Right out there. It's, uh, it's actually in between us and the part of that uh, bench that's pointing towards us, the, the seat part of the bench that's pointing towards us, is right under it. And you can see how well it blends in with the surrounding leaves around it. Those are, uh, the bigger leaves right there are sassafras leaves, and it looks almost identical to the colors of those. Really, really neat little frog. I, I think the last time I saw one of them was about one or two years ago, and uh, it was smaller. I caught it too, like I did with this one. Another kind of frog that you'll find that's not really a water frog, but you'll find it kind of near there, is uh, a leopard frog. They have light, that light green color on parts of them too, but they're more of a coppery color to them, and they have dark brown spots going down their back um, parallel to each other, just two, 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 right down the back. Cool looking frogs also. They're harder to catch though, they're really, really fast. I'm actually surprised they caught that one. I mean, huh. <laughs> That was neat. And here's the can. That was just from the walk back to the stream that I found that. I got the inside of it all nice and cleaned out. I wanted to make sure. I'm just, I'm OCD with some of that stuff. I, I didn't want to see one speck of leaf in there before I was using it for my water, so. 
it's all set and this is what I came up with for the top of the stove here you can see that hopefully it'll do get the job done we'll see I mean this balances on it but I don't know once it's full of water how it's gonna do I might have to make some adjustments or something but we'll see I mean it's on there that's what I gotta make do with right now cuz <laughs> I don't have anything else and I want to eat so you can see how it goes once I get it going well the rain let up somewhat and I uh, I ended up getting some wood I have a pile of it right over right over there I gotta cut it down small enough to go in my stove and these are what I was talking about uh, dehydrated apples this is a food saver bag for people that didn't know. Uh, it melts the plastic to seal one end and then you put the food in, put it in and it, it vacuums the air out of it and then it, uh, it seals it again right after. So I'm going to munch on some of these. These ones I actually put cinnamon on. They taste really good. They taste just like regular apples. They just uh, they're just dehydrated. You can also, um, instead of eating them like this, I don't mind eating them like this. They're lighter. There's no water in them, so uh, they're easier to pack away. But you can also take them and rehydrate them in water. Take them, put them in a pot of water for an hour or two, and they'll soak up all the water and become regular apples again. It's a good way to store and keep stuff. So, there they are. I'm about to munch away. Another thing people don't really uh, realize about backpacking, it's uh, it's not just walking out there with a pack on and getting where you're going and getting home. It's actually a test of endurance. You, you really have to push yourself sometimes. Like today, for instance, with me, I was out there walking. This is five miles from door to door from my house to this shelter. I walked it in the pouring rain, put up with the elements, I was prepared, I was dressed for it, but, I mean, the proof's in the pudding right there. My clothes are soaked still, so they're over there drying off, and uh, it's worth it. It's so worth it. Even doing the mountain hikes I do in uh, New Hampshire, the White Mountains, th those are just so much fun. What, the reward is, is when you get up there and you're above the tree line and you can see off for so far. I mean, you're literally... You feel like you're on top of the world. You, you can just, once in a while, the clouds fill in, and if you get a good day and you can just see off, like Mount Washington, for instance, when you're up there on a good day that you can see, you can see one way all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. The next way, if you turn around and face behind you, it, you, you can see all the way into the, the Green Mountains of Vermont. It's just, it makes you feel so small. I mean... Out here is not the same, Patrog, it's pretty level traveling the whole way, and, I mean, but look around. Fall time, the trees are all changing, the rain has stopped, ironically, now that I'm out here, and I'm already here, but when I had to walk, it was pouring. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's almost indescribable. You get out here and... Yeah, there's there's the the chore things you have to do like I'm doing right now. I uh, I got my pile of wood over here. I've been splitting. I just sawed up all that stuff, this stuff, and it has to be just the right size uh, to be able to put it in the in my BioLite stove back there. So I got to make these small wood pieces. I want to get all this stuff done and prepared so I can sweep out the floor in here. It's funny that <laughs> out in the middle of here there's even the the uh, comforts of home over there on the wall. I, I was surprised to see the broom so I have been tracking some stuff in before I set my tent up because it's going to take up a good amount of this area. I'm going to sweep all that back out and um, but that's after my wood's done in a pile over there ready to make food on. My stove's already over there, ready to go. I got the water filled up. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but I made a little makeshift uh, pot holder because I realized after I made it, and it, it, once the water starts boiling, how the heck am I going to get it off the stove? So that was my, my solution for that. It, it's just uh, a piece of root 
uh, mountain laurel root that's sturdy but flexible so I was able to make a loop with it make a handle and then with the the rope up on the wall over there I I uh, took some of the strands off it wrapped it around put another harder branch on the handle part for support tied that on so it it wouldn't be too flimsy and I don't spill the water but it should pull it right up uh, it, it clips on that's why I left the can the way I left it took the the inside of the can out the top of the, the inside of the top and left the the outside ring there because it, it sort of indents a little bit if I obviously you know what a can looks like like a soda can um, that lip is the perfect thing for that mountain laurel root to, to lock onto when you make the right size uh, pot holder loop out of it it just clips onto it and then with the the sturdy branch handle I made it just it'll lift it right up and uh, I mean my big challenge right now is going to be getting the water boiling because uh, everything was wet but the wood I ended up finding over there it has like I said it's been raining all night all day and I found a fallen over oak tree that was laying up off the ground and I was able to use my Felco saw, saw off some of the branches that are higher up on it that were off the ground so it wasn't sitting soaked on the on the dirt and the although the outside was wet the bark was wet the inside of it is nice and dry if you can see that there so this should have no trouble igniting plus it's oak again um, and oak is, is a really hard wood, so it shouldn't take too much of it to get that thing going. I, I'm going to make sure I have a good pile anyway. I only have to get two boils on for uh, dinner tonight and then breakfast in the morning. But I just want to make sure I have enough. I might even just want to get a fire going to, to have one going. So Once I get this stuff, it can be used as kindling after I'm done making my food, then... Um, putting aside what I need for the morning and then the rest of it can just go in the fireplace. It shouldn't be too bad. Oh, and a, a thing about the the freeze-dried food, or, sorry, not freeze-dried, the dehydrated food. One nice thing about dehydrating is that when you do it, you actually don't lose any of the nutrients in in the fruits or vegetables or whatever it is that you're dehydrating all that stuff because it happens so rapidly it, it takes the moisture out so quick all the vitamins and things stay right inside the the leftover uh, apple pieces or carrots or whatever you decide to dehydrate so even though it, it's compact it's light it's still good for you just as good as eating a regular apple off the tree so that was another thing I had meant to mention earlier There it is. This is actually a lot wider of an area than I expected it to be. They cleared it out even more. You can see past this wood pile over there, there's a whole other area. I think um, like Boy Scouts and stuff would probably get the permits and come out here and hike to here. That's why they cleared out. It wasn't this cleared out the last time I was here, and it was even less cleared out the time before that when it was pretty new. So although you would have a tough time setting up some tents here if you can see there there's a ton of stumps and ruts and dug up ground here so I wouldn't want to put my tent over there but if worse came to worse it's better than having the thick of mountain laurels around so if you had to you could <sighs> yeah so I'm gonna get back to splitting some wood up uh, I don't know if I actually showed this before Actually, I'm pretty sure I did show it now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, the way you can split up wood without anything besides this is going to be my hammer and my knife is actually my, my axe for splitting. Just like a wood splitter that you'd see at the, at the stores or something, it does the same concept. You're forcing a wedge into the wood and it's causing it to fracture off and make the smaller pieces. So I just tap away like that and there it is. You got uh, you got your wood kindling over here and it even worked if you can tell how fat 
this started out to be, I split that lengthwise like this with this and right there you can see that the wood is almost the length of the knife. It's maybe an inch or so short of the knife and I was still able to split that the same way. So I, I got it into the strips, got a couple of them here. This was one, it's been split up again and I'm breaking them down to these kindling pieces. It's actually really, really simple. Let's see. It's almost no effort to get this stuff down. Yeah. And this one I'll leave as is. It just shows you though, with, with very little equipment, with very little equipment, you can you can get yourself some stuff that's pretty big. All I have for for making fire, I mean obviously besides a lighter or or a fire steel, if you use one of those, um, is my knife, my saw, and my saw is only this big. I'll show it. Uh, I've mentioned this many many times in my other videos on YouTube. Uh, this is a Felco 600. It's got those serrated teeth right there. Those things are awesome. They dig right through the wood. Using this, you I mean, you eat through branches that are really, really thick. Here's an example right here. Uh, this one. I mean, look at that. I saw it right through that. I mean, that took maybe 40 seconds, maybe a minute, minute and a half, somewhere in there. You don't really pay attention while you're cutting, but I mean, look at that. That's a big old log just to, to get with one of these tiny little saws. It doesn't weigh very much, it's packable, it's the perfect thing for backpacking, so you're able to use this, get your wood that you need to get, cut it down to size, take your knife, split it down the middle into smaller pieces like this, and obviously you wouldn't even need to make them this small, depending on what you're doing. I'm making them really small for my stove, because they have to fit in it, they have to ignite in it, but you can leave them like this, you could even cut this way down here, so you have longer ones take the knife, split that down, and then cross it, split it again, and you have four nice sized logs or, or wood pieces to, to toss in the fire. And it's it's effort, I mean don't get me wrong, it's not like it's going to cut itself and, and split itself, but it, it's a lot easier than the alternatives. I mean carrying out a, a, a hatchet out here and a like one of those big tree saws or something. I mean, that's it's bulky. It weighs a lot, but with two things that are just about double the length of my palm, there uh, I'm able to, to get this big stuff and manage it down to small stuff really easy. Man, looks like the worst is behind me now. As far as the uh, weather is concerned, you can see up there. Partly cloudy, mostly blue sky. It's about time. Sun's over that way. I think there might be chances of rain again later on, but um, supposedly not tonight and not tomorrow. I'm going to end up going for some small game um, probably tomorrow on the way back because it's kind of late in the day. I think it's like 4.30 or something now. The Green Falls campground area is is a really good spot for that it's right on the pond green falls pond and uh... i was just looking i thought i saw a squirrel i would have had to take a shot um, but yeah i got more wood i don't know if anyone watching this has ever noticed when you see someone who who cuts wood for not a living but to to help their income they usually have huge mounds of it and they they stack it up kind of just haphazardly in a pile like that well the reason for that it's not so much laziness although i guess in some cases it could be it's to let the air circulate around the wood so if it's kind of damp that allows it to to dry out quicker and that's what i'm hoping to do over here the, I have uh, three piles I made. The, the little one was just scraps that broke off wrong. That one closest to the wall that's in front, that's the mountain laurels that were dry that I brought. Although now that I've split the other wood, it looks like I might not even need them 
to get it started because after I got down to the bare bones, pulled the bark off and all that, the uh, the heartwood of that branch was pretty dried out. So we'll see how it goes. I shouldn't have any trouble. When I get the stove on and going, I'll show that one next too. But um, yeah, I might even get a campfire. Probably not in that fireplace. I might remake that so that it's uh, more conducive to a smaller fire, but I did split some other wood right here and then kindling for it right over here. So I got this pile. I'm trying to keep it out of the water there, but that pile, the medium-sized stuff, and then I might saw that and that down to make more for this pile just to get something going. Obviously, when you're camping, you like to have a a little campfire going and the oak burns for a long time so I shouldn't need too too much of it to get a nice little fire going but I'll get back to you when I'm ready to eat still haven't set the tent up yet but you know what I might do that actually set the tent up and then um, show that after well uh, I found another little surprise besides the uh, pot and measuring cup not being in my pack I was wondering why it felt so heavy this time. The tent I have, it's a Eureka, but it's the bigger of my two Eurekas. I didn't bring the high camp like I thought. I brought the K2, which is like a two and a half person tent. So I just carried like a like a 12 pound tent out here. Man, I mean, I don't have to take the rain fly and undo that, but no wonder. I was like, this thing feels way heavier than it used it usually does. But that's why I used to bring this thing with me when I was in my 20s, but now that I'm in my 30s, it's like just a little too much. I'm still going to use it and set it up, believe me, but yeah, I guess I'm going to show you the uh, Eureka K2 tent, Then it's also a four-season tent. It's got more mesh on it than, than the High Camp does, and it's obviously a lot bigger. Man, so here, let me, let me do this. Someone out in an ATV buzzing around out there too. I can hear them pretty close. These are also uh, shock corded. If you can see that, all my tents actually are the uh, Alps Alps Mountaineering tent that I used up Mount Musalaki that had shock corded ones. It was actually only two poles because it's not a freestanding one. That's why I didn't bring it this time because I was planning on setting up shop in here. Uh, the nice thing about the K2 though, if you have two people, it's manageable, not a big deal. One person can uh, carry the poles and stakes, the other one can carry the, the tent and rain fly, or one carries the tent, one carries the rain fly, and they split the stakes and poles between them. But I've used this tent, tent for years, I've had it for probably about four years now, five years, and it still holds up great. When when I went up Mount Washington, it was actually with a few of my buddies from work. It was uh, one, two, three, there was five of us, and two of the other guys that I work with, this guy Dave, this other guy Asa, they split, did the same thing I just said. They split the tent between them, and they made it all the way up Mount Washington with it because it was only half as heavy. I meant to bring my nine pound tent and instead I brought I brought a actually I think it's twelve pounds twelve and change. I don't even think I think it's closer to thirteen pounds. But this also has aluminum stakes with it. Which are nice. They do cut back somewhat on the on the weight, but I mean for the size of it. It's 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 got to be heavier than any of the three season tents because it's meant to withstand snow when you have the rain fly on. And uh, actually, I don't need this shorter one. This shorter one is actually for the vestibule on the rain fly. So I don't even have to hook that up to this thing because I'm not putting the rain fly on. So 
close that one back up. You can yeah, see the tent over here. The way this goes, it's one, two, three. It's a hexagonal frame. The way it sets up, you'll see as it goes up. There's actually six points or six corners on it. Man, I'm still bummed out at myself for bringing this thing. It's a great tent, but it is so heavy. That just means, and now that I know which tent it is, I'm going to be thinking about that while I'm hiking back. <laughs> like, oh yeah, I got the heavy one. Nice. Well, I'll tell you what, it does go to show that you you can carry this tent out to a backpack and goes, I just hauled the friggin' thing five miles. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's a nice tent. It's You'll see once it starts to go up, these four poles go in. And then once they're in, you, you just put one in each corner. And then, it, like I said, it, it's got a lot of mesh on it. Uh, all right, so... way to do this tent, set this tent up, is to do like I'm doing, get the poles through, all four, uh, sorry, yeah, all four of them, and then worry about setting it up. What some people do with this tent is they put two of them in, get it up, and then try to run the other ones in. It's a lot harder that way. Turn this down a little bit. There we go. These poles are actually really long, also. So. I'll tell you, that's one nice thing about the 21st century is uh, outdoors technology, this kind of stuff, because. Uh, it's really nice that they have these aluminum poles, the aluminum stakes. It's it's just so much easier to set stuff up. So if you can see what I'm doing over here, I hooked. It, it's got two two poles that hook into the same point. The other two poles hook into separate points. So if you get the the first two into their spot. It makes it easier when the rest of it's going on. And then, got this one. And this one. Alright. Now I have a few of the sides in. I got three points. The other three points I'll have to put in after. But, here's what you do. This is the, uh, the tricky part because the way this goes up, here we go, it's really, really stiff. So there. Okay. Trying not to hit my camera. <laughs> you can see, uh, try and fail not to hit my camera. All right. So then. That clips in. This one clips in. Now you can see the size of this thing, though. 
it is huge as far as these tents go. <laughs> so, here we go. And that's it. It's got a front and back door. There's two doors to this thing. Two vestibules. The front one is huge. The front vestibule comes out and the, the curved uh, last, the fifth um, aluminum pole I have clips in to this point and this point right here and it just arches up outward a little bit. You have a ton of headroom in this thing. Okay. Man, I'm fucking pissed I brought this thing out here. <laughs> If it was like me camping with my my kid or something, and he was old enough to pack some gear, I'd use him as the pack mule and put part of this on him, but, ha! <laughs> oh, alright. So, here's the inside. Like I said, it's got a ton of room, ton of storage. There's actually six pockets right there. There's six more on that side. It's got two right here on the side, two more right there. These actually unzip to let air flow in. So that, um, the one up top, this one up top right here, that one right there, and uh, the one across from us, those all unzip to allow air flow in. And this one also, like the other one, is freestanding, you can see there. It's all up on its own. You don't need to stake it down to, to get it to do that. So it's pretty versatile in that respect. With with my Alps mountaineering, it's got to be on the dirt. It's got to be staked down. You can't even um you can get away with using those uh, camping platforms like they have up in the White Mountains in uh, New Hampshire, but you have to tie it off where you would put the stakes in. You have to tie a string to that and tie it off to something, so it'll stand, but it's a lot more flimsy in that regard. I'm actually going to pack some of this stuff back up, put it in the bag, put it in the tent, and uh, and leave it be for the time being. But yeah, so Eureka K2, my other tent, not the high camp. Ugh. Well, I got my bedding stuff set up in there just so you can get a better perspective of just how big this tent is. Um, right there, that's what it would be with two people in. This is my uh, Thermarest packable mat. It, uh, it's, a, it's like an air mattress. It's part synthetic, and uh, you fill it up with air also. The best way to get those set up is to, if you see on the, I'll show you over here. As far as light backpacking, this is the way to go. I mean, the, these things, they don't weigh very much. They're not too, too bulky. They pack down really small. They, you have to buy the stuff sack separate, which is the only thing that sucks. But um, what you do is when it's all rolled up, this air nozzle, you just tighten it so it stays compressed when it's in your pack, then undo it, let it fill up on its own, that's what I did, you let it suck in the air on its own, and then after it's gotten to this stage where it just, it gets kind of fluffed up, then you fill it up, you blow it up with air and seal the, the valve again so it's nice and cushiony. It's probably about a inch inch and a half loft on it and then this is a this uh, sleeping bag is rated to negative 15 degrees it's an eastern mountain sports bag it's an older model and it's uh, it works great though it one thing about sleeping bags especially synthetics like this is what people do that is a big mistake with them is they roll them up, they put them in the stuff sack, and they store them in their basement or their attic or their closet or wherever, and until the next time they go to use them, then they pull it out again and use it, obviously, while they're sleeping when they're camping. 
if you do that, it makes the sleeping bag lose its loft. So when you're storing it, what you're supposed to do is actually take it out of the stuff sack. So you get back from backpacking, pull it out of the backpack, pull it out of the stuff sack, and let it hang or let it lay, uh, lay flat open like this. Because you can see just the, the normal loft on this right now. I mean... I'd say about three inches, and that's, I mean, like I said, this thing's really old. It's probably from the 90s, could be earlier, but, uh, yeah, that's one good thing to, to do with it when you're storing those. Same thing with the Thermarest, I do the same exact thing. I take it out of the stuff sack, out of the backpack, and uh, store it away uh, like this. And then when I want to go backpacking again, roll it back up, compress it, put it back in, and get it going. It's more work that way but you'll get a lot more life out of it. It'll last you for a lot more years than if you had left it crunched up because these synthetics, uh, as far as the sleeping bag goes, they once they lose their loft, they lose their uh, insulation value. So once you've compressed it and the thing's flat like a pancake, when you go to use it again, you're going to get really cold at night, unless it's summertime, obviously. But if you're relying on it for colder weather, uh, early spring, late fall, winter, then you want to make sure you do th just that with it. Let it loft out like this when you're not using it at the house. But you can see in, in there, I mean, there would be enough room over here for another pack. Over there you could probably put a whole dog in, in another pack. I have what the, the rain fly and all that sitting there. And when this has the rain fly on it, uh, the storage spaces on the sides work great for the stuff sacks for everything. And then you have all that additional space. What I do in the wintertime with this one and with the high camp is uh, I, ha I'm, I wouldn't say do it with this BioLite stove here, but I also have an Optimus Nova, um, a Brunton Optimus Nova, uh, gas stove and that one you can cook your food in the vestibule too because it's it's got enough of a height to it where it's not going to melt your synthetics uh, the roof on it and uh, it, especially in the winter if it's raining like today if I had my tent set up already with that I could cook inside it and stay bone dry this is a really nice rated tent too I don't have a floor saver for this tent I do for the high camp I do for the uh, Alps mountaineering one but that's another good thing to invest in as a floor saver, unless you have a shelter like this where you can just put it on the wood, because obviously that's fine. I swept out under it, and uh, and now I'm I'm just uh, letting it sit over here. But yeah, that's that. So there's there's one of my tents, and when the time comes, I get the stove going. I'll I'll show you that next. Here's the, uh, the BioLite stove, so it comes with these little fire starter pieces. Some people throw the whole thing in. I like to throw just a little piece to make it last longer. These catch on fairly quickly. You can see there. Now, the, the fan that gets the air circulating in here, I don't like to use that right away if I can avoid it. I try and, there we go, I try and get the fire somewhat going before I turn the fan on. There we go. Alright. It, it's, it's actually establishing pretty quick. Oh man, the only part I'm nervous about is this rigged thing. I just hope it holds the water on there right, because I'm kind of hungry. That's why I put it off till last, because I wanted to get everything else situated. Worst comes to worst, the jerky and, and apples, but man, that would suck. I, I brought these mountain house meals here, expecting to eat them, so... I mean, you can you can do it with... with uh, there we go. With cold water, but I, I don't want to do it with cold water. 
So we'll see. Right now it's. I'll show you. It's starting to go in there a little bit. I got enough kindling in here to establish it. So they they advertise this as being really clean burning, but it, it is once it's going, but to get it going, it's not so clean burning. I mean, this thing produces a lot of smoke when it's first getting geared up. And sometimes it takes a few tries, it doesn't just start right away. The fan has two fan settings, low and high, and uh, the, the lower one's usually used just to get it going, and then you switch to the higher one after. <laughs> after all the little hang-ups, the uh, forgetting the pot, the bringing the wrong tent, I hope this thing just starts. I mean, it looks like it's gonna, but... On Mount Musilaki, like I said, it was just terrible wood. You're up on a mountain, it's damp all the time, and uh, it's all it's all evergreens up there, so you end up um, making do, but it took a while to get that thing cranking at the beginning. And that uh, the probe that goes in here, that copper probe, has to get relatively hot before it starts working and uh, powering the fan and everything, so that's another thing to keep in mind with these. I actually wasn't sure how it was going to go the first time. Uh, and a bench test in my yard at my campsite that I have back there, it worked great. It did exactly what it was advertised to do. But then, again, on Mount Musilaki with the damp wood, it took a while to get this thing going. It did. It did cook the food, and it cooked it in about a minute and a half, two minutes. And here it goes. You can you can see here that it's it's starting to gear up. But... Oh no. Ooh. Let me do it this way. Because this is really thin aluminum, I don't think it's going to hold up for me. I'm going to have to, like, hold this thing over this. That's kind of rough. Hmm. So, lesson learned, can't use this, don't use a can to make a, uh, make a, a plate for these things. <laughs> I'm not worried about this can because the water in it is going to keep the, uh, the metal from melting or anything, but, man, that's rough.
and then again it's going to depend on how long this wood holds up before it burns up <laughs> Tell you what, it's getting warm. I just can't uh, can't hold it on there much longer than I did. <laughs> take a little doing. So back on here again. I'll tell you what, it's working. It really is. The uh, this is like the the worst case scenario way to use it, but. I actually had to buy a, uh, a bigger pot, a Primus pot, because of this situation right here. I had a, an Optimus, uh, Brunton Optimus Solo set, but that set was, um, was too skinny for this. It, it would have plugged the hole. It would have sat in it instead of on it. 
So, I went and got that other one, and it works great, and it does what it's supposed to. But here we go. Take that back off. Push these sticks in. <laughs> that one. I will tell you, this thing gets super hot. <sighs> Oof. Now there's wood in there, but the fire actually burned out. That. Ooh, the water boiled. You see what I mean, though? It's it's not clean burning right now. It is, uh, it is charging though. Like if I had my USB plugged into the camera I'm using right now, it would be charging it because the green light on the side's on. Like I said, this is the worst case scenario for this stove. <laughs> If you have the proper cookware on it, it does work great because you can just you toss a couple sticks in and then you uh, put the pot back on. Me having to do this balancing act thing, just this isn't the way it's supposed to work.
There it goes. go. I got a rolling boil on here. Oh. There it goes. Whew. I did it. Ha! I didn't think I was going to be able to get it done, but I did get it done. Camera shows 19 minutes. Oh. Only because of the gaff stuff I'm using. Like I said, usually it's a minute and a half. And this thing's good to go. It is working like it's supposed to, though. And this wood, you saw, it was pouring out. I just diced it up. It was something that's been getting rained on all day and all night. And it's in here and it's it's working. <laughs> Doing its job. Uh, now I just gotta figure out how the heck to pour it. Mm. Good deal. Looks like I get to eat today. <laughs> I was getting worried there. Ugh. So now with the Mountain House meals, that's it. You just, well, there's the BioLite stove. Right now, this this bottom LED, uh, it comes on, not these two, but the 100 is like a long bar when this thing is, is charging, when it's gotten enough voltage to charge. And uh, it's not doing it now, which surprises me because, I mean, as you can see, this thing's got a monster flame coming out of it. So it looks like in the morning I'm going to have to go through that same thing, but once you've seen it once, you don't need to see it twice, so that's how the, that thing works. Here's the BioLite stove. Gets the job done, even when even with a rigged can from down the road in the woods. And, <laughs> man, I'm just glad I'm eating. So there's the Mountain House meal. You take it, uh, hot water goes in it. And then uh, just let it sit 10 minutes and it's good to eat. And that stuff's so good. Doesn't matter what kind you get, they're so good. Even stuff I don't like normally, I'll eat uh, the Mountain House meals of. But that's that. And you can see the sun's actually going down behind me here. It's starting to get on dusk now. It's not here yet. I mean, you can still see it's still pretty bright out, but the sun's coming up on the horizon over here. Yeah, right behind that big, tall, uh, the fattest oak tree right there, yeah. <sighs> Good deal.
And there it is. So buy a late stove, Eureka tent, Patrog shelter, one of the four. Okay, it's the next morning. Uh, I got the site pack back up. I got everything cleared out out of there. Got my pack back on. It's actually a really nice day out. It's a little windy out, a little brisk, but I might be able to get something. I'm going to head down to uh, the Green Falls campground now and, and try some hunting with my, with my 22. So we'll see what I can come up with. Hopefully I'll get something, and if I do, I'll turn it back on to show you guys how I, I prepare or dress the game down. Check this out. Uh, another snake. Let me just put the camera down. This one's uh, this one's not a water snake. It's just a garter snake. You can you can see there the patterns on it. Again, look at its. You can see its eyes like that of like ours. It's not elliptical like a cat. And if you see right in the middle of its belly there, right here. It just ate something. It's got something in there. You can see how much fatter that spot is than the rest of them. He was just munching away. I'm actually going to put this guy down. And then put this guy down here. And then watch him go off. See? Uh, you can see that there. See, the thing is, it's too cold right now, so it doesn't have much energy to, to do anything. See? Huh. Oh, it's down there. I'm just going to leave it be. That was kind of cool to come across, though, because it's really cold out right now. I'm surprised that thing isn't denned up yet. It's probably, like, low 40s or something, maybe maybe mid-40s, but, yeah, that thing's still just hanging out. That's why it didn't move when I when I grabbed for it. It just, <laughs> it was really simple just to, just to go down and pick him up. First, I thought he didn't think I saw him, but then, uh, once I had him and he was still not moving, I'm like, ah, yeah, this thing's just cold. It hasn't warmed up for the day. But it's it's actually still down there. Huh. That was cool. Another animal to show off. Here's another nice water supply, a little bit down from the path I came from. Um, back on the Patchogue Trail again. The shelter's, I don't know, about... 300, 400 yards back on a different trail. This thing right here gets real slippery in the uh, wet weather or in the snow. This granite. And you can see how easy it is just to slide right down here, right to there. I mean, it's not as bad as 
the Beaver Brook Trail on Mount Musilaki, because obviously there, if you slid down and fell, you're dead, but here you're just soaked. And on the wrong time of year, I guess that could mean that you're in a world of hurt. I don't know if there's any fish in this or not. I've never ch tried to fish in here, but you, know, you can see the rocks here with all the moss on them, so you gotta kinda sidestep so you don't fall in or slip in. So the last time I was out on this trail, you can see right here, it was it was last year, or early, early this year, and uh, no, actually I think it was last year, I think it was last year in October, just like it is now. Um, I was out here on a Saturday, small game hunting, but I stayed overnight at this same shelter, the Peg Mill Shelter, until Sunday, and then uh, I hiked back out Sunday. Well, in Connecticut, you are not allowed to hunt on Sundays, so what another nice thing that I had mentioned at the beginning of this video about this rifle is the easy breakdown. You, you pop out that pin right there, the, uh, the upper receiver folds open like you saw, the, uh, the bolt comes right out, and what I ended up doing was... Uh, Saturday night before I went down for, for bed, I pulled the bolt out and I, I tossed it in, the whole firing pin, it's all one assembly. Uh, I threw it in the back of my backpack, zipped it up in there, and then when I hiked out on Sunday, I, uh, I had the, the upper and lower together, but this, the firing pin and bolt was not in the gun, it was in my pack, locked, or tucked away where I couldn't get to it. So if any uh, DEM had come up and asked if I was hunting on a Sunday, because uh, like I said, you're not allowed to, I could have showed them plain and simple, held the gun over and said, check it out, it's got no bolt in it, it ain't firing anything, and the bolt's in the back of my pack where I can't get to it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that was one of the, the odd laws about out here, because you're allowed to camp at the shelter, you're allowed to hunt on... Saturday, but I mean obviously you can't go poof on Sunday and make your gun disappear So this is one of the best guns for something like that where you can just pull it right out There's no doubt that you're not hunting because you have no firing pin in the gun It's it's might as well be an airsoft rifle at that point um, And ironically on the hike out on Sunday uh, a pair of hikers had come up uh, it was a guy and his wife and the guy was a real jerk, like, trying to, I kept, I, he, he asked me, oh, so what are you, you out here hunting? I said, no, I was actually hunting yesterday, uh, you can't uh, hunt on Sundays, I thought, and he goes, yeah, no, you, you can't, you can't hunt, so you sure you're not hunting? I'm like, I just told you, I'm not hunting, and I can show you the gun, the bolt's taken out of it, oh, no, 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 I'm like, you know, you guys should probably just keep going because uh, you, you put me on the defensive for no reason and I, I'm out here obeying the laws, enjoying the park just like you guys, so... And then uh, he, he starts, well, you know, you can't hunt on Sundays. He starts back in with that again. And like it, it, was, it was like talking to a wall. The guy was the biggest jerk. And I, I was even willing to show him, I tried to show him that there was no bolt in the gun and... He just wouldn't hear, just kept saying, oh yeah, hunting on Sunday, hunting on Sunday. I'm like, no, I'm not. <laughs> then I asked him if he was uh, law enforcement or anything, and, oh, no, 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 uh, you, you, you know, you know, you shouldn't have that out here then, and, so, you run into that kind of person, and one thing that the DEP recommends when you come into that type of a person, when you're in the right, and you're not doing anything wrong, is, um, it, tell them that you feel harassed, the person, I mean, in front of you, that, you know, I feel like you're harassing me, and I did, I told them, you're putting me on the defensive and, and making me have to explain my actions when I shouldn't have to because it's no business of yours of what I'm doing out here. And uh, the, the DEP recommends that you 
take your, if you have a camera phone or something, take it out, take the picture, and tell them that you're going to turn, turn them into the, uh, the authorities when you get to the nearest uh, area where you can do that. And then that usually gets 90% of them off your back and gets them on their way. Because, like I said, you, if you're in the right, you're in the right. And you, shouldn't, you, you have a legal right to, to be out here enjoying the park, doing game hunting and everything, and, and they have no right to be harassing you because of one of your recreational activities that you like doing. Whether they're anti-gun, anti-hunting, whatever, it's none of their business what you're doing, and you don't have to put up with that. So that was one of those times that I told the guy point blank, you need to leave me alone because I'm going to do just that to you. I'm going to go over and get the authorities down here, take your picture, and you can explain to them why you're harassing me, and I'll press charges against you. And they, uh... They, they, he moved on his way, and he shut up, which was good. I got sick of hearing him. Huh, well, that yeah, that was just a little heads up about that. You, you, even if you're the one out here uh, hiking and or, or hunting or whatever, and someone starts giving you a hard time, they're not in the right, even though they think they are, and they have their dog in there with wife, and they're walking around like they own the park. They technically do not, so huh, don't put up with any crap from people. I'm on the uh, Nahantic Trail, and down there, as you can see my elevation up here, there's Green Falls Pond, and there's the dirt road leading to the campground. The campground's just pretty much right down that way. You can see it through the trees somewhat. A couple of the sites, there's a picnic area exactly across the road from me right there, and uh, I think they... They closed it to swimming last year, but you can uh, you can uh, do just about everything else out here. Yeah, this is the area I was looking for squirrels in, and mainly because it's too windy, I don't really see any. But I stopped to to take a look around a few times. There's plenty of woodpeckers and songbirds and stuff, but can't hunt them so. Uh, I'm surprised too this was a good area last year for this I mean there was a bunch of them running around it was a little later in the season though I think the uh, the trees had a lot less leaves on them at the time I went so maybe it was November when I got harassed by those uh, hikers it could have been hmm But I'm going to keep on looking though for them. Well, I'm back up at my house. I was able to drop the pack and um, down at the, the campsite in my yard for a little bit. Just trying to wind down. I actually lost my my bandana I had and I was able to go back into the video clips I made saw the last time that I had it and then I know when I realized it was gone so I'm gonna go a little later with my kid and walk that trail again and try and find where I dropped it it isn't that long of a spot that I I did it was somewhere from one of the dirt roads leading into Green Falls to a trail that comes back out at the campsite so not that long of a trail I'll go through and figure out where it is. Plus, he likes going for the walk, so it'll be a good time to get him out there, get him some exercise before bed, get him down. <sighs> Unfortunately, the um, the snake and the frog were the only things I was able to catch out there yesterday and today, mostly because yesterday it was pouring all day, and then today it's it's really, really windy, so... All the, the small game is kind of hunkered down for the time being, trying to avoid the winds. They're going to be low on the ground or up in their nests this time of year. I might be able to come across something here in my yard, but probably not. I haven't seen any uh, small game around here since last year. It might have moved on. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it was a good hike. Besides losing the bandana and the couple little hang-ups, I, I did manage to make my food, so I was psyched about that. The stove worked fine. 
And uh, yeah, I'll take you along on the next one when I get another place going.